Um, so thanks again for joining us today. Uh, I'm just going to run through, kind of update you a little bit on kind of some of the, the work uh, that we've been doing in the forum lately. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit more about today. And to anyone who's just joining us, um, I just remind you please to, to mute your mics as you go um, and to let you know that we are recording. So, um, so student success is uh, kind of one of the, the, the four strategic priorities of the forum. And this comes in under the, the this particular webinar, uh, comes in under the DESI project, uh, Data Enabled Student Success Initiative, which is a stream within the um, student success priority. Um, and if I could remind people to please uh, mute your microphones as, you, as you're coming in, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, this is under the, the DESI project through which we've been working with institutions over the last year and a half. Um, and more about that later, actually, I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Under the DESI project as well, I'd just like to uh, kind of inform any of you who don't know or remind any of you that, you, that do um, about Orla, our online resource for learning analytics, uh, which is available through the, the teaching and learning website. Um, so I'll be uh, distributing these slides afterwards. Uh, so this will be available to you. So Orla is a publicly available uh, web library of resources covering everything from strategy development, data quality, uh, making effective interventions, um, and so on. Um, it's, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, i to just remind you to, mi to mute your microphones again, please, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so we also have a, a suite of, of ever-expanding case studies, and we have a few new case studies to add in there as well, on how institutions in Ireland and how uh, teaching staff in Ireland are currently using data to, to enhance their, their practice and to support student success. Um, I've also just uh, given a, a URL, a connection to one of our recent publications, which is um, specifically designed to support institutions looking to develop strategies. It runs through kind of key stages of strategy development and links to the relevant resources within Orla um, that will help to support that. Um, and that link is there. And sorry, I'll just ask you if you wouldn't mind muting your microphones again. Um, also, this is the second in a series of webinars, um, and I just put up the URL for the recording of the last one, which we hosted in May of last year, um, again with some really, really fantastic speakers, some really interesting things happening. So just as part of it, um, kind of as, as, as we draw towards this, this phase of Orla and DESI, uh, one of the things that I've been doing is kind of going back to institutions that we've been working with, just to get a sense of the, the kind of impact that the project has had to date. Um, so I've, I've had kind of um, semi-structured uh, interviews with 13 of the institutions that we've been involved with, with the universities, institutes of technology and private colleges around the country. Um, so of those 13 that we've spoken to, we see that uh, DESI has contributed to 16 strategies and policies within those institutions. And there are um, initiatives that have been kind of supported by DESI underway in nine of them. Um, so we're really seeing kind of a, a decent amount of activity on a national level coming in there. One of the things that people have said about participating in DESI is that it's helped to drive a really student-centered approach to data use. And that, I think, is really fundamental to what we've been trying to support, is a student-centered, data-informed approach rather than a data-centered approach. It's, it's critical that we remember kind of why we're doing this at all times. Um, we've had reports then from the, the, the conversations that um, within institutions, we're seeing more and more conversations between people kind of across the institution, between staff and students, between senior management and, and uh, kind of everybody else. Um, and it's the, 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 the area of data is increasingly being seen less and less as the, the kind of uh, domain of the techies, uh, which I think is fantastic. We can all benefit from a, an evidence-based approach. We see a growth in uh, cooperation between institutions as well, which is absolutely fantastic. We're very, very lucky to work in such a, a collaborative sector. Um, there's reports then from each of the institutions, sorry, excuse me, um, that um, data culture is kind of growing on the ground. We're seeing more and more um, teaching staff, for example, using the reports within the VLE. Um, and finally, one of the other things that, that the last thing kind of that's been reported across the conversations is that having a, a, a national um, level focus from someone like the forum has actually helped to kind of um, support interest within institutions. So I, I'm really, really delighted to be able to kind of share with you the, 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 the impact that 
our work has had. Finally, uh, a last quick plug. Um, as I mentioned, DESI comes in under the student success stream. Um, so you see here we have a, a number of kind of new publications out recently. Um, on the left hand side, we have our, our report on student success, uh, which we've been kind of working on most of this year, uh, which looks at kind of it looks at national policy, it looks at institutions, it looks at uh, student feedback to get a sense of what success is or what we mean by success, um, goes through um, a substantial literature review to look at the enablers of success, and finally culminates in our, our national understanding of success. On the right-hand side, then, you have the, the four-page insight, um, for those of you who, who don't have the time to read the full fella. Um, and in the middle, we have um, my colleague Alison's report, which looks at the data coming in from the Teaching Heroes um, Awards. Uh, so it looks at a substantial volume of feedback from students about what they value um, in the, the teachers that support them. So three kind of hopefully useful uh, reports there, certainly Alison's is. So a big thank you again to our speakers today. Uh, so we have Hazel Farrell um, from Waterford Institute of Technology. Um, I, I'm not going to kind of uh, spoil the surprise by telling you what everyone will be talking about. Uh, we have Peter Jan Bonn, who will be talking about the, the Offla project, the Onwards from Learning Analytics project. And um, we have uh, Mark Glynn and, and uh, in, in spirit, uh, Shadi Karazi um, from Dublin City University. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass on to the, the stars of the show and I'll get out of the way. Um, so Hazel, I shall pass over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Lee. That's great. Thanks, Hazel. All right. Um, so, um, and uh, well done on all the amazing work you're doing. It's absolutely fantastic. It's very kind of you, Hazel. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So, um, just to give you a, a little bit of context, um, I work in, oh, my slideshow. Sorry, that was me. Excuse me. <laughs> is, this, is that you, Lee? My it it is. I'm staying away now. Can you put it back to the start for me? Or is, uh... There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so yeah, just a little bit of context then. Um, I suppose uh, I teach on the, I, I lead the music degree program in WIT and I'm very interested in uh, technology for creative uh, disciplines. And I'm particularly interested in these analytics because um, I feel they can really enhance student experience and also my own experience um, as an educator as well. Um, so uh, I basically um, began to uh, use uh, analytics across a range of my modules. Initially, it was to address um, student engagement concerns. So basically, I wanted to get a clear picture of the level of engagement with module materials. So I just wanted to be able to check on you know, how often the students were logging in and engaging with the materials, how long they were spending on the materials. And um, then I was also um, having a little look at um, their level of understanding of the different concepts that I was um, presenting um, them with. So, um, and I felt this was particularly necessary on, um, I have one fully online module and with that one, because I wasn't seeing the students at all, I felt it was really important to start there. So that's the one I started with, but I do apply it to my classroom modules too. Um, so what I was doing then was I was using the data to identify at-risk students and this was in the context of of retention and attrition. So it provided me with an invaluable means of quickly identifying students who were not engaging or who were struggling with module um, content. Um, so no matter how comfortable you know, or safe a classroom environment you create, um, there will always be students who are not happy really to ask for clarity on a topic or who, you know, to admit that they're not really with you or they're not getting what you're talking about. And, you know, I suppose I've learned through experience that, you know, when you, when you ask your class, like, you know, do you understand any questions and everyone just agrees and they're like, yeah. Of course we do. Yeah, no question, no questions, but don't trust them. You know, can't be trusting them. So, and you know, sometimes then you only discover that at a very late stage in the semester. So I felt a need to actually address this. So that was my second driver. And um, my final reason for using analy analytics was actually to learn how I was doing as an educator myself 
in terms of engaging my students and actually consolidating their learning outcomes as well. Um, I'm very, very passionate about um, participative learning and I really, really strongly believe the students have to be actively involved in the learning process um, in order for it to be a meaningful learning experience. And then I was able to sort of use that type of ethos as a driver behind what I was doing as well. And, you know, I think you can operate in this sort of blissful, ignorant state where you know, you're lecturing the students and you're feeling that, oh, I'm doing a great job, I know what I'm talking about. But I mean, the students may not be with you at all. And I feel that that is a strong responsibility on you to actually address that. So uh, that's where I was, uh, that's where I was coming from. So what I did was then in, in my particular institute, we use um, Moodle. And within each of my modules, this is a very typical example of um, one of my um, topics uh, within uh, This is a Western Art Music module. So what I would do is I would, um, first of all, I would um, have my presentations up there. So you can see there's a YouTube version, there's a PowerPoint uh, version, there's a PDF. I also use Adobe Spark quite a lot. So I'd have the presentations, then I'd have my resources. And at the end, actually, the most important bit that's going off the screen there at the end, the most important bit for this, this purpose is uh, the quiz. So at the end of every topic, I would have a quiz. And initially, I used the quiz to, um, for the students just to, so they could test themselves and, you know, to consolidate their own learning and also um, then for revision purposes before we were coming up to assessments. Um, but later I changed that and I'll talk about that in a second. So this is a typical quiz for me, short quizzes, 10 questions within Moodle, absolutely simple to set up and I use a mix of true or false and multiple choice questions and again when I started doing this I thought oh my god should you know this is so obvious everybody will know these answers they don't know the answers they don't at all so what you presume is extremely straightforward that anybody would know they don't know so this really brought it to light for me so that's a typical layout of uh, you know the start of one of my quizzes there and these are really short. They take uh, five minutes ish in class. So uh, the students just basically take out their mobile phones, they log into the Moodle page, and we start the quiz together. And uh, I'll just show you here on the next page. This would be um, my sort of the data that I'm collecting from it. So you can see very clearly here that you know there's an average of around you know five five you know nobody hits six minutes but it's ranging from two ish up as far as you know five and a half minutes that's how long it takes so it's no great effort on their part and you can easily integrate this into your class if you wish or else they can do it in their own time it's up to yourselves so um then you can see just by looking at this if i take a horizontal view I'm identifying student issues. So I'm identifying individuals who have issues. And if I take a vertical view, I'm identifying an issue with what I have not actually effectively portrayed to the students. So I can say, for instance, there with uh, question 10, I'll have a look at that topic and I'll say, well, actually, there's quite a number of students who have not really grasped that concept. So then that's my problem. So I need to go back and have a little think about how I tried to get the material across, how I didn't achieve it to my satisfaction. And then I'll just uh, rethink my approach the next time. Um, so just by looking at this one then uh, here, quick analysis, two students, very, very clearly in difficulty because there was like, you know, the majority of the question wrong for both of them. And then I need to work at enhancing an understanding of questions one and questions 10 because quite a few students had actually fallen down on those one, ones. So just by glancing at it, I can immediately, uh, you know, take this data and turn it into something positive. And I also feel that by, you know, being able to do this quick analysis there, just at a glance, that it really works for um, larger groups as well. So when you don't have time to be looking, you know, into detail at every single thing, just to be able to glance vertically, okay, this topic, this topic, I'm going to have to look at, okay, this student here is in, in difficulty, this student here is in difficulty. Very, very straightforward, very simple, you know, nothing, nothing crazy complicated about this at all. Okay, so then at the impact, um, I've had very, very positive um, 
feedback from the students um, because I tend to sort of incorporate them into the assessments, into the feedback. I incorporate them into every aspect I possibly can of the learning in order to sort of reinforce that whole meaningful experience we were talking about. So they enjoy doing it. They, they actually enjoy testing themselves and just seeing how they're getting on. And um, because it's so short, no great deal of effort for them. And the fact they can just take out their mobile phones, log in, do the quiz, submit, end of instant feedback you know they appreciate that um from for me i found that it gave me a heightened awareness of how effective my approach was to different concepts and in this context then i was able to adapt my teaching in the interests of ensuring clarity and also accessibility for my students um, and i feel that i'm actually engaging the students from a more informed perspective and this personally gives me a greater sense of fulfillment as an educator i feel like i'm actually doing a good job you know um, as opposed to lecturing the students and just standing there being totally oblivious to whether they're actually uh, getting it whether they're involved or whether it's benefiting them at all do you know so it's not about me it's about the students and i'm pretty happy with myself about this um, and then the last point i suppose is uh, the early detection this actually helped me to identify very quickly at an early stage um, if students were in difficulty typically before this it could have been week six uh, in some cases it could have been week 12 before issues would have been highlighted due to you know however the assessments were laid out now I give quizzes very very regularly um, practically on a weekly basis on, with a, a trial group I'm working with with my first years at the moment and uh, it's great because I was able to identify students that needed extra learning support at a very very early stage in the semester and I'm pretty happy about that too um, okay so in practice then what has this meant um, I have increased the number of quizzes I'm using these are all short quizzes and I use them across a whole range of my modules I set them weekly or bi-weekly just depending on how we're going with the materials and um, I've also started to allocate um, continuous assessment marks for the quizzes after co consultation with the students I had a discussion with them because before it was just for revision purposes or you know whatever just for themselves so I had a conversation and I said how would you feel about this so they actually felt that it would take pressure off them and they were happy um, to be able to uh, um, complete assessments in this manner so I now use them uh, as continuous assessments throughout the semester um, and then the other thing I have done is I have used started to use quizzes across a broader range of modules originally I would have stuck with my survey modules such as music histories and things like that but um, this year with uh, my year one students I've started to apply it to practical subjects such as composition um, so I'm testing basic music literacy uh, in uh, their quizzes here and because it's a really really vital thing to our particular program you know they have to have these music literacy skills because uh, they basically are transferable across a wide variety of other modules and most students fall down on it actually so I was able to um, identify students that had issues by week two and set up the learning support for them in practical modules as well as just the theoretical ones so that's basically uh, what I'm after doing so to sum up everybody quizzes <laughs> rock thank you Lee. fantastic okay. <laughs> thank you very very much Hazel okay Sorry. Uh, just turn this off. Sorry, I'll be with you in one second. No talk, among, talk among yourselves. <laughs> so thank you very, very much, Hazel. That's absolutely fantastic. And I think like one of the things that's really interesting about that, you know, there's this perception that to really get value out of data, you need a, a swarm of data scientists and you need a, a budget of 400 grand and a platform that does, the, you know, all, all the bells and whistles. Um, and I think it's really, really, really terrific that you show that something, I mean, clearly a lot of work went into planning it and setting it up, but something that is manageable by one person you have um, a, a source of information for feedback, informed practice in real time. You're, you, you have the early detection piece. Um, I mean, we see that having that on a module basis is really, really beneficial. And using the data then to, to employ kind of assessment for learning, um, which I think Geraldine will be pleased that I've uh, managed to, to hopefully interpret that correctly. Um, so really, I, I think that's a, a fantastic um, 
it's a fantastic achievement. Does anyone have any questions if you'd like to join in? Um, so either vocally or if you want to use the chat box, uh, we've a couple of minutes for questions for Hazel if anyone wants to. Thanks, Nabla. Um, hi, Hazel, that was great, thanks. Do you always have the student, or sorry, do you always have the students do the quizzes in class or do you have out of class ones too? I have used the latter, but I worry about cheating. Thanks, Nabla. Um, yeah, do you know, I've done both. Uh, with the fully online module, um, they obviously did the night of class because I never met the students. And at, at that point, I wasn't using it for assessment and it was really uh, for their own benefit. So I felt that, you know, if they wanted to gain from it, they needed to actually just be honest about the thing, you know, to be whatever. But in I used uh, the ones now in class and it's just simply because it's like a group activity. Everyone, they take out their phones and everyone logs on and then there's a little bit of competition over who's submitted it it creates a nice sort of dynamic do you know what I mean and um, I think they enjoy doing it together nearly you know as, as a group so yeah I've, I've actually done both um, so uh, yeah that's the answer to that one fantastic thanks Hazel so then uh, hi Sinead uh, oh hang on um, hi, uh, thanks Sinead hi uh, thanks Hazel have you been able to use this data to inform longer term curriculum change or modular program to improvement rather than kind of in module change for your practice or do you have any plans for doing so? Yeah, we do actually. We just went through um, school review and uh, we have like a revised program, you know, um, coming up in 2020. So uh, what we've done with that then is we've introduced a lot more um, flexible uh, learning options. So we have more blended options. We have more online assessments going on in there. So absolutely, we've applied it to our program. And actually, it's part of our institute strategy now as well to uh, get all of this moving. So I'm quite happy to be out there and you know pushing it forward. And um, we coordinate with Students' Union as well, and they're quite happy about this too. So you know, I think all in all, it's very positive. And yeah, absolutely, we have applied it to our new program. So there you go. Fantastic. Thanks, Hazel. And thanks. There's a note there from Mark as well. There's a, a lot more. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, there's a lot more quiz statistics available within the quizzes, um, a hidden gem that people may not know about. Uh, the statistics give you information on how good or challenging your questions are as well. Uh, under the admin window on the quiz, there's a result tab. Just click mm -hmm. on statistics. Yeah. So, fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, and thanks again, Hazel. It was absolutely terrific. Really, really appreciate you giving up your time. Not at all. No problem. Happy to be uh, here. Thank you. So moving on, um, I'll pass over to Peter Jan. Um, and I'll, I'll get rid of my... Thank you, Lee, for um, giving the opportunity to let us share some of our work on the Offload projects onward from Learning Analytics. And also thanks to Hazel for her first talk. You'll notice that uh, some of the advice we have uh, from our research project so far links to the small interventions she's doing, which are often uh, quite valuable. So our project name is Onwards from Learning Analytics. And the idea of the project is that um, we often have a lot of data available to us in an institution. And we have spent, or some institutions have spent a lot of money and time on making all the data communicate, uh, communicate with each other without having a focus on what will we do with the data and why do we need all the data to correspond with each other. So what is the focus of our work is with the data we have and sometimes with the limited data we have, how can we use it in the best way possible to affect students, to affect coaching, to affect uh, curriculum design, etc. That's why we call it onwards from learning analytics. We work with a model uh, in three steps and the first one is prompts and this links back to data. Um, how can we use data to signal that we should do something, that there's a problem. Um, that will also be the first part of my talk. The second one uh, is linked to communication. How do we communicate this data to students in order that they are one, informed, or two, take the step to see, for example, a counselor uh, or somebody who can help them? And that's the third one, an intervention. During the intervention, when should we start 
uh, referring to the data? Should it be the starting point of our discussion? Should we consider it as something shared or as something that we uh, own as an institution or something that a student makes? What, um, what will I be talking about? One of the outputs uh, we're finalizing now from our first year is a literature review in which we uh, snowballed through the literature. Uh, we started looking uh, according to a, a typical way to do a literature re uh, review with keywords and uh, searches, but we came up with very little in which learning analytics was linked to coaching, guidance, advising. Um, so we went another approach, we took another way, uh, we did another approach, which was snowballing through the literature, where we started from existing reviews of learning analytics, and we looked at what um, articles in those reviews would be interesting for us, could be linked to coaching, reference a sort of uh, follow-up of the data, sort of use of the data. So we started with two reviews, and this led us to 39 articles that we selected for abstract screening. From those, we processed 23 articles that were still relevant, and they discussed a total of 48 cases uh, in which learning analytics was, uh, were used in one way or another and linked to coaching or um, to translation to, well, not just on the data, but really using to support students. From those 48 cases, 36 were unique cases. So some articles discussed cases that we also found in other articles. I think the main clue is work with what you've got, but use it effectively. And this has been um, something, well, data has been around forever, I think, in education. If you look at the basic things like scores uh, or, or scores on quizzes or scores on exams, it's also how you communicate, how you start from these, what you do with them. Do you just offer them to students or not? So basic data are available. And often institutions have a lot of data that are very specific for their student population, but they don't always use it that well. The second general conclusion that I want you to take from this uh, small talk is that communicating concerns and guiding students to support that often already exists in your institution um, is often the best you can do or uh, the most efficient. Uh, we saw um, or we read about uh, big interventions where students were informed that they were not doing well and had to get their act together and other ones that set up extra exercises, learning platforms, etc. And they didn't see, for example, a difference between both students. I'm not saying that, uh, that the second one is worse than the first or the first is better. It could depend on the situation. But um, communicating to your students that they might be at risk from what you've seen might be enough to change their behavior. And the second and the third one, sorry, if we talk about intervention, uh, interventions, is that we see that sharing the data that's available to lecturers, support staff, uh, advisors, all those kind of roles, and also to the students can improve the time between student and mentor advisor talk. Students have the feeling they don't have to repeat their life story over and over and over again, and that you can really start a conversation with sort of basic knowledge what happened before um, and use that 20 minutes or that half hour that you have with a student uh, as a next step rather than having 20 minutes of the 30 recapping what has happened uh, through mouth of the student. So some other uh, things that I wanted to share step by step uh, according to our model on data. First one, if you use data, I would advise that you use a combination of data, not just data of um, things that cannot be changed, like where is the student from, how old is the student, is, what is the gender uh, indicated by the student, etc. cetera, um, but also actionable and recent data. And I would like to refer back to the quizzes done by Hazel. Um, seeing that students don't do the quiz, uh, could be uh, an, uh, a sign that they're at risk, that they're not engaging with the material, informing them, hey, you haven't done the quiz, uh, what's happened? Uh, it might be that the reply is, oh, I was sick, or I didn't know it, or um, I don't see the value of the quiz. And at least that's something actionable and recent. Students can uh, get their act together and do the following quizzes. So they ha there has to be something that they can change. If I would tell Lee that 
men with beards from Ireland are less likely to succeed in higher education. And he wouldn't, well, he could shave off his beard, but there's not anything else he could change. So it has to be actionable in the data. The second thing is if you have data, and you want students to be self-guided or you want them to improve their own behavior, you should try and, and make it visually and continuously accessible for all stakeholders. I remember a good example of it. It's a platform somewhere in the, the Netherlands and all they have is the students' um, success rate. So they know which courses they passed or failed. Um, and what they've done, they've put them on a very visually attractive platform and they also added the expected date of um, graduation. So a student who had failed a lot of classes this year would get a message like your expected date of graduation is January 2025. And it would be a very clear message based on actionable data that they have to do a bit more their best or try to succeed more and um, that they could see people to help them with that. But uh, it would be visually and continuously accessible. They would clearly see that date and it would also be able to change if they put in effort in the next exams. These are some examples of very visual dashboards where a lot of color coding has happened or you could see um, how well you're doing as opposed to your peers. And then the last one, data should lead to an intervention, preferably a targeted intervention to a specific group. And I think the minimum is making students aware that what they are doing is not enough or what they're doing is good and making them aware of that, that they know I should get my act together, I should put in more effort and I can do it this and this way because you of course used actionable data. Communication, communication should again be actionable. A student should be able to do something after the communication. It's a, uh, not just be sad that he's not doing well, but also get some guidance on what he or she can do. The communication to a student should also be or come across as personalized. The, we have the power to make communication look like it's personalized, uh, even though it's mass generated and it has a different effect on a student. And the last one, support staff should have the final say. They should be able to exclude a student from an automated message that's saying he's not doing so well because they might know uh, something's happened at, at their home situation. So people uh, taking up, for example, a care role in their house when the parent is sick um, would be excluded from these emails saying you're not doing a good job, get your act together. The last one is intervention. You should start the conversation from the data. It should be the starting point. It's very objective. Um, you should also present it as shared between the student and the uh, counselor or the advisor or the lecturer. It's not, this is what I know and I think because of this, you're not doing so well. It could also be that the student says, well, looking at these grades, I'm actually very happy because I was expecting to fail more classes because of this and this reason, rather than you saying, okay, you failed half of the courses, you're not doing so well, you have to work harder. So a shared aspect from the beginning of the conversation. And the last one, I forgot to put something in bold there, but the word in bold should definitely be timing. Um, early intervention is often very easy to do. Um, if you put in those quizzes and you see students are not re reporting or they're not filling in the quizzes, you can from week two or three con connect with students and saying, you're not putting in the quiz, have you missed how important they are for this course? Also, if you want to talk about exam results, you should do that after the first exam period, not after the second. So considering when you place these interventions is crucial. I think that was my five minutes. I've gone over it a bit maybe. I don't know if there are questions. Thanks so much, Peter Yan. Great overview of the project. Thank you, Sarah. I believe it's really important that dashboards come with human interaction. Who or what role is targeted as taking that task on? Um, I agree. The, these dashboards are uh, valuable and are a way forward sharing that um, information. But we sometimes um, in the communication, it could just be, look, we noticed this. Could you let us know if you're all right or not? Uh, or if you need a conversation. So we have that step allowing students to opt in, for example, for, uh, for another talk. And um, 
Mark asks, do students have the ability to turn off the dashboard and are they displayed by default to students? Um, we don't have a dashboard ourselves. I think in Nottingham Trent, the dashboard is default to students. And if I read anything, um, it would be unfair not to share the data with the students as it's their data and uh, just have it accessed by lecturers, support staff, advisors, or any of those uh, roles. And coming back to Sarah's question, who or what role is targeted as taking um, taking that task on? I don't really understand the question, or maybe it's just a reflection that can be uh, as well. Hi, Peter. How do you measure the impact of interventions? Well, this is something we're doing now um, in our own project, uh, where we're talking to students uh, to see how the communication came across. We're also looking at um, attendance levels during graded evaluation classes, where we have sort of quizzes like uh, Hazel had, um, but they count for the final point uh, of the exam. So they're really important classes to miss. And we started emailing students who weren't in those classes to say, um, look, you're not in those classes. How come? Well, not how come. Uh, these classes are important. We see that students who do not participate in these classes have lower success rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Mark agrees with sharing the data with students, but if the dashboard greets them every time they log on, this may cause them harm. Yes, you're right. Um, it's not something that should pop up when you log in. It's something that you should be able to access anytime. Who is the person in the institution who makes contact with the students as a result of the dashboard output? In the Nottingham Trent case, those are um, advisors, uh, support staff. In our university, we have um, each student is in a group and that group has a sort of um, a tutor, lecturer kind of responsible for that group who sees them on a weekly basis. And that would also be the person who can address that um, to students. Uh, so they already have a sort of um, personal relationship with them. Um, it's not the, that's what makes come over as personalized and not the machine that says do work harder. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much, Peter Jan. Um, I think that's it's such a, a critical reminder, that, and this is kind of something that, that we've very much emphasized, that analytics, you know, in and of itself doesn't actually achieve impact. It's, it's what you do with it that's absolutely critical. And I think that I love that phrase, work with what you've got, but use it effectively. Um, I'm absolutely going to plagiarize that horribly from you. Um, I think, again, the, the giving students actionable guidance, making it easy for them to take um, effective steps afterwards, I think, again, is another really critical aspect. Thank you very, very much. The, the only thing that just I would uh, kind of question you on, we've done some very, very, very up-to-date research on the success of men with beards, and apparently we found that there is an outlier group that where they're outrageously handsome, apparently it doesn't apply in that instance. Uh, so I knew you, you can't argue with the science, unfortunately. I'm going to mute my microphone before I apply. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter Jan. Um, so, sorry, if you just bear with me. And I'm going to, well, hang on. This is bound to engender confidence. I'm going to pass over now to uh, Mark in just a moment. I'll just get rid of me first and I'll see you afterwards. Okay, uh, let me see, do I have control? Okay, can you hear me first of all, I suppose? Loud and clear, brilliant stuff. Okay, so um, thank you very much, and 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 two incredibly interesting talks, um, with with some great clear points coming out from from both of them, and uh, hopefully it's generate some ideas for the speakers and or for the the audience, and indeed I can try follow it up. So um, where we've got, we're not going ahead here, Lee, for some reason. Ah, oh, there we go. Right. I want to chat to you about how we use uh, analytics to, uh, with regards to student assessment and very conscious of Peter Shan's comment about having actionable analytics. Um, this is what we want to do, pull data from Moodle, uh, data that we could action very clearly or data that will uh, address an existing problem. And I've uh, undertaken this project with my colleague, uh, Shadi Karazi, but it's actually connected to a wide variety of uh, assessment related projects that we've been involved in. So I would like to acknowledge uh, the, the support of all of the team actually involved, both past and present members of, of the team. Um, 
it, who have worked on projects connected to this one. So um, what we have done is we were listening to what the students were saying, whether they are saying it throughout uh, the, the student evaluations or feedbacks or the ISI, all sorts of different sources of feedback we pulled together to hear what are the students saying and what are the staff saying. And if I concentrate on the students, because obviously they're more important, uh, if I concentrate on the students, the, uh, they were complaining about being overassessed or they were complaining about being overwhelmed and, and exhausted by the, the assignments. And a lot of the complaints were, um, well, I had all of the assignments in one week and they weren't getting to spend the time on the assessments that they felt they needed to or would have liked in an ideal world. From the staff's perspective, they came back and they were saying, I don't know what's going on in module X. So for example, the chemistry teacher had no idea what the biology teacher was doing or biology lecturer when they were assessing and what they were assessing. On some cases, and I'd like to say more rather than uh, the majority rather than minority, we did get um, individuals who took it upon themselves, staff members who took it upon themselves to ring their colleagues and collate all all of the exam dates and assessment dates and put them in a calendar as part of the program handbook. But that was a, a manual process for the most part. But what they were able to do was to get an overview of the assessments. And if we're looking at this diagram where we have the number of assessments on the vertical axis and the week of the semester, so week one right through to, to uh, week 13, and then they were able to plot graphs like this. So this was module A, and we could very clearly see that in week 12, there were two assessments. Week 13, there were three assessments and another two in week 14 in this case. And then we had another module that looked like this one. Um, again, small assessments. In this case, um, we knew they were being assessed, but didn't quite know what the assessment was. And then we had another one like this. But these are all manual, uh, manually collected data. And the problem with it was that pretty much as soon as the lecturer hung up the phone call or created that, um, created that manual, the, the, the course handbook for the students, the data was out of date already. That maybe for whatever reason, genuine reasons, lecturers may choose to change their assessments, add in a second one or change the date or uh, take it away from being on, on uh, due for, for two things, breaking it into draft submissions and, and final submissions and so on. So the data was not live. And as any analytics person will tell you, um, bad data is sometimes worse and I would say all times worse than, than no data at all. So what we wanted to do was to look and see if we could get Moodle to actually automate that entire process. And uh, the challenge that we had was we had to get the data into Moodle in the first place. But what we've done was we did a, a huge PR drive with our staff explaining to them the advantages of putting in the dates of their assessments into their Moodle course. And then we were able to generate this report. So just to explain what we're seeing on this report, um, you see some tags up the top, the BA in journalism and the BA in languages. That actually means that in the module, English 101, it's taught across two programs, journalism and languages. And what it's doing is it's highlighting here across the weeks, if we look at the bar chart, across the weeks, and the 14th of the 10th, there is one assessment, 21st, there's one assessment, and then again, you can see the 25th of the 11th, there's three assessments. But it gives you this calendar overview of the, um, of the assessment. So this is what the student sees, this is what is automatically entered into the student's phone, and because it's in the app, or because it's in Moodle, it can be synced automatically with their Google Calendar, which comes as part of their DCU account. We're, a, we're a, um, a Google college, but obviously this would work for Microsoft colleges as well. So we're able to pull the reports on a program basis. So if we want to just have a report for all of the journalism or all of the languages course, in this case, where it's taught across um, two different modules, you can, if you wish, uh, hide the assessments due to just languages and just show the ones for the journalism students or vice versa. You can also hide the assessments and just show the quizzes or hide the quizzes and just show the Turnitin submissions, whatever the case may be. Okay, but the whole concept about it now is that the, all of the lectures will have visibility 
of the other assessments that are going on. And more importantly, all of the students will have visibility, live dates as to what it's about. And because all of that data exists, um, the, everybody's a winner. And the only thing we require uh, lecturers to do is to turn around and create the assignment. Create the assignment by simply logging onto their course page, add the assignment, put in the title and put in the date. And if that's all they do, this calendar is automatically generated. It's at that stage the PR exercise kicks in where my team will go around saying, well, seeing as you have the assignment on, what else can you do? Well, there's an advantage here if you correct online or you have submissions allowed online or whatever other functionality we want to highlight there. So we've taken um, a very simple step and then done a huge PR exercise um, to try to promote further benefits of it. Um, another plugin that we used, we looked, we wanted to have reports for lectures on the, the um, how the students are interacting with them. So here on this module, there's an assignment breakdown for this module test assignment. And there's two assessments in here and we can see there's four students on the course. No, uh, for non-submissions, no late submissions, and obviously they haven't been graded, but it also gives you um, an indication as to how many of them scored below a particular point. And then following on from that one, let me just come on one more. Um, sorry, I came forward too quick. You can also have a breakdown of the students, right? How many assignments has Kira submitted? How many were, uh, was she late for? Or sorry, how many did she not submit? how many uh, late submissions and what grades they were. And again, is she at risk? What sort of, how many of those are, are low grade um, assignments? So this is all available within Moodle. We use the, the My Feedback plugin for this particular feature built by UCL and we built our own plugin for the assignment calendar. We listened to staff, we listened to students, we said, what is the problem that you're having? And we use the analytics to actually help us make informed decisions. And uh, that's how we, we, we move forward from there. It's all about using the data to inform proper pedagogy, not to steer the pedagogy, but to inform it. And then the very last slide I have for you there is with one simple step, we can generate a huge amount of data by simply asking the, the lecturers to insert the deadlines and uh, it will automatically create the calendar book. The calendar is viewable for all, anybody that has the appropriate permissions to view it. You can then see the online submission for the students. You can analyze the submissions and the deadlines and the late students or not so late students. And you can monitor student progress across the program. That's all just from one data, one data step that we ask our lecturers to do. And because the program coordinator now no longer has to spend the start of the semester ringing up his colleagues or ringing up her colleagues to pull together this handbook, they are a big driver of getting this done, of encouraging their colleagues to do it. And the heads of school are also big drivers of doing this. So that's what we've got. And if you have any uh, comments or questions, ask them now or indeed email Shadi or myself at any stage that suits you. Hello. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Um, yeah, this, I think it's some really, really interesting work. One of, one of the things that I've seen from the, the work that we did on student success, you know, I mean, we looked at the enablers of success and you know, we found things like engagement and assessment and feedback and data informed decisions and institutional cultures and so on. All of this stuff is absolutely critical. But from talking to students, uh, without meaning to kind of make 250,000 people sound like a, a single blob, the thing that kept coming up over and over again was these major kind of logistical and infrastructural hurdles that they had to face. So you have lecturers putting all of this work into kind of really effective assessments, really good, meaningful, supportive pedagogical assessments, but then just through either a lack of data or a lack of organization, the, 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 it's the student that suffers. I think that's absolutely fantastic to be able to take such a, a data informed approach to it. And the other thing that I think is really interesting, you know, I mean, I, 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 the, the, the ability of targeting individual students, I mean, we see is, is key and is critical and the power of early warning systems, but being able to use data in this way that you can make simple changes that improve the experience of a large number of students at once again, I think is, is absolutely essential. So thank you very, very much. Um, 
So does anyone have any further questions there for Mark? I think you've covered everything, Mark. Read the data they've all fallen asleep. <laughs> I think Peter Jan has them all still thinking about my beard. Yeah. Well, presumably, I'm sure you're you're happy for anyone to to follow up with you kind of afterwards, Mark. Presumably. Ab absolutely. Yeah, it'd be my my pleasure. Oh, here my we pleasure. go. Th thanks, Angelica. Uh, great food for thought, Mark. We could very easily encourage course directors to create a program site in our VLE where all students could be added and where they can access an aggregate calendar as well as uh, generic resources. Very very easily done. Yeah. Um, and again, would we'll be delighted to to um, show you how to do that. The the program um, plugin that we've developed, that tagging feature, means you can circumvent that because every student uh, is enrolled in the modules, the course pages um, on on Moodle, and it collates them all and generates the calendar automatically for you. But if you only use the calendar for a program page. Um, yes, it will definitely work, but it wouldn't be the best way of using Moodle or any VLE uh, just as a document repository and a calendar way. Absolutely. So thank you very much. We just, given that we have just a couple of minutes left there, um, I might ask um, Erky, um, Erky Harkonnen, if you wouldn't mind, sorry. Do you want to unmute there, Erky, and just tell us a little bit, Erky's running a, a project in Finland. Uh, which now we might ask, Erky again, you might come back to us um, kind of properly for a, a future webinar. But just if, if you wouldn't mind while we have a couple of minutes, just telling us a little bit about your project. Okay. Okay, thanks Lee. And thanks for everyone who has been uh, presenting in this webinar. It has been very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm uh, Erki Harkonnen from the University of Turku in Finland. And uh, we are part of a national uh, development and research program called Analytics AI, so Artificial Intelligence and Learning Analytics. And it is actually coordinated by the University of Oulu in the northern, Finland, in the northern part of Finland. And we have been working now for uh, almost a year and uh, we have one year to go. So it's a two-year uh, two project funded by the Ministry of Education and Culture in Finland. So it's a national one. We have seven universities uh, as partners in, in the project. And what we are doing is actually uh, um, trying to uh, work on three work packages. And one that we have already, uh, I would say that it, it's already, already finalized is that we have analyzed user needs and uh, uh, like data, data sources what are available and what what is what, what we can use and what what kind of data can we combine about student progress for example and uh, we have discussed about indicators so that uh, what are the indicators that we we need to follow uh, in order to uh, help students to move forward and uh, to stay in their plans and all that and we have taken a look at uh, different kind of tools and methods that, uh, for example, VLE is like Moodle is uh, presenting us or providing us uh, to use. And uh, we have in, in, in this pro project, the University of Tampere is making an uh, application development for uh, a student dashboard. And uh, we are going to pilot that, that uh, dashboard or, or application uh, in, in several courses, also in, at the University of Turku, but also in the other partner universities. So we get some information about what works and what doesn't work and how to help students to progress uh, better. Uh, but that will take uh, some half year or something like that so we can come back with that results later, perhaps. Fantastic. But what is really interesting is that um, we have uh, tried to uh, take a look at the legal and ethical aspects of, of learning analytics. Uh, so what, what is, what is the, for example, GDPR is uh, what they can, 
that, or what we can do in terms of uh, of GDPR, for example, and other legal issues, and what is ethically correct. And we have decided that the, um, we need institutional level, uh, like policy on learning analytics. So where the responsibilities and roles of different uh, shareholders, for example, uh, teachers, counselors, program leaders, the management of the university, what they are, what are their roles and responsibilities to, in, in, in the learning analytics. And that's something that uh, we are at the University of Turku, we are now working on or starting to work on, on basic of uh, Alta University's experiences. So that's a very quick <laughs> look. <laughs> Janne might add, is also working with me in, in, in the project. So. Fantastic. Well, thank you very, very much, Erky. Sorry, sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, and no, we'll okay. look forward. You, you, you might come back to us kind of next year. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, be, we'll be running kind of further webinars. Um, I'm, I'm really, really interested, and I, I know we all would, to hear, hear more about your work. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. So that's Thanks. it. Um, we, we made it. Um, I managed to not entirely break the computer. Um, so thank you very, very much. Enormous thanks to our presenters. I think we really, really, really interesting stuff going on. And it's great that we can kind of get a sense not only of the stuff that's happening here in Ireland, but that, that's happening across the, 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 the continent as well. And it's fantastic to be able to, to broaden those um, arms of collaboration, if that's not too poetic for this time of day. So thank you all very, very much. Um, this will be, uh, I'll make this available on the, our website. And we shared the, the slides and the recording will be there as well. So thank you all very, very much and, and bon appetit. Take care. Bye now.